Hi there, I'm meteorologist Aaron Tuttle from AT's Weather and today's topic of interest in a series on severe weather that I'm producing is about tornadoes. So pick up a chair, grab the family, and let's all learn together about these things and what you can do to be safe and seek shelter from them. Uh, tornadoes get the most attention out there across the country. They're the ones that get all the headlines and they're the ones also that usually cause a lot of death and injury. So let's see how you can avoid that. Well, first off, I want to let you know that there's about 1,200 tornadoes a year on average. Sometimes we have more up around 2,000 and sometimes we have less, less than 1,000. This is going over about a 15 year period. And when we take away some of the duplicates and overcounts and we look way back in time, that value still looks to hold right around 1200. For example, in 2018, we had about 1200, but once they reduced the multiple accounts, we dropped down about 994. This is kind of an idea that each year is gonna be different. But if we look at that mean value of 1200 and we go back in time and count all the tornadoes up from 1953 to today, guess what? They all stay the same. In other words, the trend is flat. So that is good news. We are not seeing an increase in tornadoes overall for all categories. Now, some years we do have quite a few more. And like we said, some years we have quite a few less. So it's still all averages out. Now, if we look at the tornado trend for the violent tornadoes just alone, this is the EF3, 4, and 5. So not all tornadoes, just the ones that do the most damage and death. The trend is actually down. As a matter of fact, it's the lowest in history. Uh, if we go back, um, we used to average about 56 a year through 1985, and now we average about 34 a year. So that's a trend I think we can all agree on is a good one to be at. Now, when I talk about these EF0 to EF5 tornadoes, it's on a damage scale. It's called the Enhanced Fujita Scale, and they're assigned wind speeds which correlate to the engineering damage that happens when a tornado goes through. So it's not necessarily wind speeds measured, it's just what they know of structures that are built, the integrity, when they start to decay or diminish or get destroyed. So when we're talking about an EF0 tornado, easily survivable. Wind speeds of around 85 miles per hour, does very minor damage, some tree limbs, uh, a few shingles, that kind of deal. We're talking about an EF1, that's 110 miles per hour, that's moderate damage. It will actually topple or badly damage a mobile home, so you do not want to ride out a tornado in a mobile home under any circumstances. Uh, it'll probably a little bit of light damage to a home, a well-built home, so some you know roof damage, broken windows, busted doors, that kind of deal. EF2 is where we finally get into the structural damage. So it's what we call considerable wind speeds of 135 miles per hour, roofs torn off, uh, homes shifted off their foundation, mobile homes completely destroyed, large trees uprooted, snapped, cars can be tossed. So this is why we say don't be in a car. EF3, 165 miles per hour, severe damage. This is where we have well-constructed homes destroyed, significant damage to large buildings, weak foundations, with those homes blown away, trees start to lose their bark. EF4, now we're up to 200 miles per hour. We call it extreme damage, which is well-constructed homes are just leveled. Cars are thrown significant distances. Uh, top story buildings will probably collapse. EF5, this is the worst case scenario. This is massive, incredible damage. This is where well-constructed homes are swept away. Uh, steel reinforced concrete structures are critically damaged. A high rise building sustained structural damage, trees are debarked, stripped, snapped, uprooted, you name it. Even on the ground, when it comes to asphalt in some cases, that's actually removed to just the bare dirt and soil underneath. And then, like we said, the only thing left of a home in that case would just be a slab, like the example here behind me. Now, despite the fact that a slab can all be all that's left, you can actually still have parts of the home still remain that you're seeking shelter in bathroom, closet, that kind of deal. That has happened many times I've seen it. And that's the good news, meaning, believe it or not, you can still survive these types of violent tornadoes by taking shelter. Tornado tracks, let's talk about it. Along, I, uh, along the basically the eastern sides, eastern slopes of the Rockies, onward to the east coast, that's where most of them reside. You still get some baby tornadoes, which is what I call them, across the Rockies in the west. There is an uptick here when you look at uh, historical time uh, where things kind of ramped up in the low, uh, early 90s and then they kind of peaked in the early 2000s and then they rolled flat again. And then actually in the last few years they've gone downward. So technically the trend since about 2012 is downward. 
So for the last six years, that's okay with me. Uh, but again, if you want a higher number of tornadoes, it would be these. Now, when you start to look at all the other um, tornadoes that we're talking about, the trend is flat or downward. So here's a look at the EF1. Uh, again, slightly stronger than the EF zeros, but still occur over the Rockies. So that dispels the myth that you cannot have a tornado over the mountains or over a hill or even over a valley or a river or body of water. They can occur anywhere. But because weather conditions don't exist in an ideal form along the Rockies and Western to the Western coast, they usually just don't happen there. But they will happen elsewhere, as you can see. EF2, we're starting to get less and less, and the trend we talked about is downward. As we head into EF3, the trend has been downward in the 90s and then holding kind of flat with a slight decline. Uh, and you can see not much here in the western parts of the country. The western third is almost tornado free at this point, but they still continue out east. EF4s, we're getting into the rare breed, but they still continue here across the central plains, the midwest, the southeast. The trend has been downward and continues. And then the EF5s, these are the big ones we talked about, the most violent, uh, kind of anchored here across the central plains, Iowa, near the Great Lakes, and even down across Alabama um, and um, Mississippi and that kind of area. So if we look at the trend here, not only is it down and flat, but then we really don't even have a good database because there's so few of them. And that's the take home is how rare these are. Tornado distribution, Texas 140 a year on average. Uh, we look at uh, Oklahoma, we get about 56, Kansas 80, uh, Alabama 42, Florida 59. So these are on an average basis across the continental U.S. Even Vermont and New Hampshire get them. Now Alaska, Hawaii, and Puerto Rico, they typically don't see a tornado on an average basis. Now, tornado distribution across the countryside here. You can see that there's a peak around eastern Colorado and here in uh, Oklahoma and also down across the southeast and yes, even Florida. Now when you fight, it's all tornadoes. So you can see if you want to call it Tornado Alley, Tornado Alley is a large area, so it's not that it's shifting, you just have some hot spots within that. Now here's an example of that. Here's an EF4, EF5 distribution, central parts of the country for Oklahoma, Iowa, and then down across the southeast. So that's how tornadoes break down across the country. Now, the occurrence of tornadoes, if you were to guess we get our peak in the late spring, early summer, you would guess correctly. May is the month for tornadoes. They're also high in June, they're still somewhat high in April and July, but they go down pretty quickly to and, and prior to those time periods. But we can still get tornadoes in December across the country. If you look at the time of the day where they're most likely to occur, if you were to guess, well, it's gonna take some daytime heating to get that instability and the heat and moisture, right? So you would think later in the afternoon, you'd guess correctly. So about four or five o'clock is when things start to peak out. And as the sun starts to set, then the uh, tornado occurrence goes down. Now, seeking shelter. Homes, as we talked about on that EF scale, if they're not anchored to a slab, they're not going to be stable. So this is an example where the home was removed. So if they're taking shelter in a basement like this, you're not safe. In a vehicle, mangled, you are not safe. You do need to find adequate shelter. Mobile home, again, you are not safe. So these are examples as to how you have got to take it upon yourself to find adequate shelter. And this, my friends, is not one. This is actually a pet peeve for every meteorologist on the planet. This is a no-no. Forget the idea it's illegal. Throw it out the window. We already know that. I'm telling you, you're, all you're going to do is set yourself up for death and everyone behind you that you trapped. Because now you've trapped everybody to where now all of you are going to perish because you think you're safe and you're not. I understand what you're thinking of primarily is monetary value of damage to your car because of hail. I understand that. But you got to let that go and know that insurance can cover it if that becomes the case and you couldn't get out of Dodge, so to speak. But what I would presume, uh, prefer you to do is to be proactive and know before you drive into a storm. How are you going to do that? Grab a mobile app. I'll give you an example of mine here in a minute. They'll have radar on it and you can see what you're about to head into. Your passenger can keep tabs on it. Uh, the app that I'll have will actually alert you if something's coming your way. But back to this example. The Venturi effect, which is winds actually increase under this manner. If you're trying to take shelter from a tornado, it's going to sweep you out, take some of those cars with it, damage, death, destruction, you got it. And that's for you and everybody behind you if that tornado takes the path along the highway or the interstate. 
so don't do it. Plus, you're blocking the escape route for others and emergency personnel. And then finally, let's say there is no tornado, but you've all done this. People coming in in a heavy thunderstorm can't see that far ahead of them. You get big rigs, tractor trailers, cement trucks, whatever you name it. They can't slow down in time. You got a problem. So just don't do it. Tornado facts. Regardless of the climatological average used, 50 years, 35, the good news is as follows. The majority of tornadoes are those weak ones, EF0 to EF1, easily survivable with minimal damage. Uh, again, that's 70 to 80%. 12 to 22% of tornadoes are EF2. And then five to eight are the EF3, four and five, which of course cause the most fatalities and the most damage, but at least they are the most rare kind. So how do you stay away from tornadoes? First off, a lot of you kind of grew up in the era where tornado sirens were a big deal. You do not depend on tornado sirens. They are a last resort. As a matter of fact, the National Weather Service does not advise you to use these as a resource. They occasionally malfunction. They're only really made for people outdoors that are completely clueless of what's going on. Uh, in today's modern era of smartphones, that should never happen. Uh, and also, if they sound, it doesn't mean a tornado is moving towards you. Each emergency management office has different policies for activation, and now they, there is one purpose they can be uh, used for, and I will give them this. If a warning is not issued by the National Weather Service, in other words, a tornado warning is not issued, which does happen, it's rare, but it does happen, these can supplement that if someone sees the tornado and they have emergency management verify that and they can sound the siren before an official warning comes out but that's a rarity now when it comes to better resources number one on your list should be a NOAA weather radio they are programmable for your area they're usually reliable I'd probably say 97 percent of the time there will be a small percentage where towers will go down during a severe weather event. It does happen, either maintenance or something breaks, but usually reliable. Uh, however, like I said before, it's only good if a warning is issued. Uh, sometimes warnings are missed, and therefore you would not get notified by this device. Now, if you've got really good TV guys uh, and gals on, on the uh, that you're watching from your local news, and they're really into weather, and they show you all kinds of radar, and they can actually read a radar presentation and tell you there's a tornado, then that can fill the gap. It's real-time information. However, it may not cover your area um, because of, one, you don't have a station close enough to you uh, where you're not in their market, or two, they're focused on one storm here, and they're not focused on your storm. Now, when that kind of thing happens, you can use mobile apps to fill in the gap. So mine is one of those called AT's weather to go um, It's used to get your attention to seek shelter. Uh, it's also dependent, like any other app, on cell or Wi-Fi coverage. So just make sure you have that, and those apps will work for you. Now, for mine, for example, you can download a Google or Apple Play stores. It's free to use. It actually predicts tornadoes about 15 minutes ahead of time before the National Weather Service issues a warning. You're like, well, how does it do that? Well, it takes current radar trends and it puts it in a combination with proprietary algorithms to forecast tornado development. And then it sends you a warning. It says twisting storm alert. It gives you a value of like one to 10. Uh, and that value, the higher it is, the stronger the certainty that it's producing a tornado. So again, it's a heads up and a seek shelter immediately type um, product. It also will tell you if lightning and storms in the area. Soccer moms love it. Um, athletic directors love it for that reason alone. Get the kids off the fields. Uh, plus, um, here in Oklahoma, I have direct access to my live weather coverage and emergency management. I will try to implement that in other parts of the country over time. Uh, but for right now, I've got it set up here in Oklahoma. But here's an example of how you can get warned on my app. You can enter 16 locations to receive custom personalized alerts directly to your address. In other words, most apps will warn a county. Well, if you're in the southern part of the county, you don't need to take shelter. So it will not bother you unless you're in the immediate path of the storm, which is unique from all other apps. Uh, finally, you can enter with the 16 locations, work, maybe you choose, you got a spouse that works a different place, uh, you've got schools of say three or four kids in the family and each one's at a different school location, uh, maybe you got a vacation home or two homes you want to keep track of, the grandparents, you name it, you've got 16 options to where if you've got a twisting storm alert, you want to be notified, put them in the app and you're good to go. So those are some examples of how you can be safe and be aware of traumatic development.
giving you an idea of where they occur across the country and the percentages as to seeing the small ones versus the large ones and how having a weather app like mine can keep you out of harm's way and keep you and your family safe. So I hope you enjoyed this presentation. Like I said, please share it with your friends and family so everyone can get educated as we continue during our spring and summer season, which as you remember from the graph is our biggest tornado season. Please follow me on social media. You'll find the links on the next slide. Take care.